Welcome to the program. I'm Nima Abouard, and this week we're assessing the state of Egypt's economy. The currency has tumbled, foreign investors and tourists alike are fleeing the country, but this week banks opened to queues of people desperate for cash. So is this a sign that Egypt is getting back on track? We'll be finding out. Also coming up this week, investors are playing a waiting game as trading on the Egyptian stock exchange is halted, but what's expected when trading resumes? Is there such a thing as a free lunch? While Egyptians struggle, Kuwaitis get free food, a helping hand from the government, or a cynical ploy to win support in difficult times. Hot money as cash moves out of Egypt amid the unrest. We assess a turbulent year for investors in the Middle East. Creating an industry and jobs from scratch. How Saudi Arabia is tackling the threat of massive youth unemployment. But first, it's more than a fortnight since tensions erupted in Egypt. It has brought the country to a standstill and is costing it dear. Some estimates put the cost of unrest at $310 million a day. But there are some signs of normality now. Banks are reopening and some businesses are trading. So does this mean that Egypt is back on track? Katie Watson reports. As another day dawns, anti-government protesters in Cairo's Tahrir Square are standing firm. Joining them now are striking workers from across the country. And all the while, there are signs that Egypt's economy is struggling. The Egyptian pound last week fell to its lowest level since 2005. In the first two days of protests, shares fell 17% before the stock exchange was promptly shut. And tourism, which normally accounts for more than 10% of the country's economy, has been badly affected too. This last week, though, there were some positive signs. Banks started to reopen and despite long queues, customers were able to withdraw much-needed cash to buy food and pay their bills. The government's been working hard to shore up confidence. It currently has about $36 billion in foreign reserves and it used military planes to fly in more than $850 million of cash to avoid a feared run on the banks. We enter this period where, the, if you look at foreign reserves, that they have been at their highest ever. I think uh, uh, the, the government has, has generally done well in terms of uh, monetary and fiscal policy as far as Egypt is concerned. So Egypt stands in a reasonably good, good position. The initial indications coming out right now is that there is no massive run. If it were to happen, it would have happened already when the banks started opening, and you haven't seen that. Small steps may be, but the struggle continues for many businesses reopening again. We've been shut for 10 days. Today is the first day we've opened, and since opening, no customers have called. The market is very slow, and I think this applies to all of Cairo. It's not just economic factors that are of concern. The political standoff is what's affecting investor sentiment. That's led rating agencies to downgrade Egypt as a place to invest. The politics is clearly key to the economics in Egypt right now. Um, political event risk can have uh, significant knock-on effects in terms of the public finances and the macroeconomic situation more broadly. Uh, tourism is an important element of the economy. Um, that has no doubt been badly affected by what's happened. Um, also, if we were to see large-scale capital flight, that would be concerning. Banks reopening and businesses starting to trade again are just some examples of how Egypt's government is trying to get the country's economy back on track. But there's still a lot of uncertainty. The real test comes when the country's stock exchange reopens. It's been closed for more than two weeks now, and a resumption of trading will give a clear indication by investors both in Egypt and abroad of what they're feeling about the current situation in Egypt. Katie Watson reporting there. So what's likely to happen when the exchange does reopen? And that's a question I put to Amir Ansari, chief strategist at Gulf Mina. We've had about two weeks of, of uh, the markets being shut as of now. I think it'll be a good thing if it does open up on Sunday. However, depends on what happens over the next few days. Are we going to see more riots take place? Are we going to see some sort of fundamental shift on where the transitional government's going to come through? 
if there is some sort of calm that's brought about, then perhaps we could see it open up on Sunday. Uh, but there's, there's no saying with the, with the current political regime. So what's best for investors? What's best for the country? Best for investors right now is obviously the current regime, uh, simply because they are very, the Mubarak's regime has been very good in terms of economic liberalization uh, for the country. And we've seen a tremendous amount of growth for obviously certain sectors in the economy. If we see any shift of government towards more of a socialistic manner, then we don't know what the repercussions could be in terms of current account deficits, fiscal deficits, uh, companies' earnings on a bottom-up level. So I think we need to see what happens on that level first before we start making judgments in terms of where the economy is headed. But isn't keeping the stock market closed just delaying the inevitable? Aren't stock and shares supposed to find their natural place? 100% agree. However, if you even go back to other crises where very kind of parallel to what's happening now, uh, you look at Pakistan when the when, uh, same thing occurred, they shut the market as well. When they opened it up, they put a kind of 1% circuit break on it and it ended up, anyway, ended up shutting, shutting down as well. Uh, if you go to Bangladesh as well, same thing happened. If you go over to Venezuela as well, it happened. So I think that though, yes, we have to allow for free markets to kind of find their natural ground, I think they, the governments in these kind of economies don't want to cause too much panic more so than it's already there. And when it opens, what's going to happen? If things stay the way they are right now, I would imagine that we actually see fairly large sell-off in the markets on Sunday. So in terms of investor sentiment for Egypt and appetite for Egypt, where are we? Well, let's look at anecdotal evidence. The government, well, the central bank issued $15 billion worth of T-bills uh, as of two days ago, of which only $13 billion were actually bought. Uh, of which only about 2% were foreigners. So how is all of this affecting the country's economy? Basically, we're going to see economic growth be hampered this year. So ec economists are expecting around 5.8% GDP growth this year, which I think will probably be revised downward to easily the 45 to 5% mark. But that's still quite significant. Sure. The GDP growth, however, is not correlated with, not highly correlated at least, when it comes to market direction. So you could have years where GDP growth is stupendous, but the markets actually crash because there is no investor sentiment for a lot of these companies and, country, uh, and, and the country as a whole. Omer Al Ansari from Gulf Mina speaking to me earlier. Now, amid tensions here in the Middle East over rising food prices and soaring inflation, Kuwait is bucking the trend. The government there has just passed a law giving its citizens free food for a year. And that's on top of a massive cash handout. So is this simply a generous gift or a ploy to win government support? And what does it mean for the businesses cashing in? Well, Ben Thompson is in Kuwait to find out. To mark the 50th anniversary of Kuwait's independence, the government is giving its people something to celebrate. They'll each get three and a half thousand dollars and free food for a year. A welcome gift, but at the cost of five billion dollars. But Kuwait can afford it. Thanks to its massive oil reserves and relatively small population, this big cash handout won't dent government revenues. In fact, rising oil prices this year mean the government here is set to record another budget surplus. But the move does highlight the big differences between the oil-rich Gulf and its other Middle Eastern neighbours. The unrest in Egypt and Tunisia was sparked by soaring inflation and rising unemployment. Those same problems do exist here in the Gulf. But it certainly seems that here in Kuwait, the government is prepared to offer cash to its residents to appease some of those fears. But not everyone is convinced by the handout. Rula Dashti is a local MP and chair of the Kuwait Economic Council. She says the money could be better used elsewhere to solve the same social problems that led to unrest in Egypt and Tunisia. It's not an effective way to distribute that wealth because that wealth is not for this current generation. Whoever thinks that I can finance these problems by natural resources forever is mistaken. Because you're talking about more than 60% of your population under the age of 18. So there is an obligation on the leaders of these economies to look for, don't buy, oil money does not. You need to solve the chronic problems properly. And the oil natural resources money you get from gas or oil should be a catalyst for this transformation and this digitalization not to hide the problem. But nonetheless, Kuwaitis are spending that windfall. 
They won't receive the money until the end of the month, but it's already sparked a spending spree in the country's shops and malls. But like the debate in Parliament, even here opinion is mixed about just how the money should be used. I think it's not a good idea because instead of spending more than one million Kuwaiti dinar for this uh, payment, it's much better to have a good hospital, to have a good education, to spend it in a very wise way, not that way. Lately I'm thinking of traveling to uh, the US and uh, some of the money I think I'll spend at home buy some furniture. Mm, I hope I can save half of it and I spend, I spend like uh, half of the money. I'm not going to spend it. Uh, I'm actually like against it because they could use the money for a lot of better things do, like doing it for the country. But one store that's doing well from the boom is this one. After a tough few years business is back on the up and they're hoping for a similar boost in sales that followed the last government handout. Last time was 200 dinars, uh, which was the grant per head. This time it's a thousand, so we expect a much higher expenditure on electronics this time. But last time I remember that the week immediately after giving the grant, we had the highest ever sales uh, for several days after that. So people do like to buy electronics. You know, Kuwaitis, uh, there's 1.2 uh, million Kuwaitis in Kuwait. Um, and almost 40% uh, of them are below 30 years of age. Now, people who are younger, they buy stuff like iPods, laptops, uh, Blackberry, iPhone. Uh, so that's the young population, you know, the 40% uh, of the population. Then we got the families and, you know, they buy all the uh, big screen uh, plasma TVs and uh, washing machines. So all the new stuff that has come in, they're really, their eyes are on this now. But whilst it's good news for the shops and the shoppers, there are concerns about the state's willingness to bail out its citizens and the precedent that may set. Unlike many of its neighbours, Kuwait does have money. Just how it chooses to use it is now being more closely watched than ever. Ben Thompson reporting from Kuwait there, right? We're going to take a short break now. When we come back, gearing up for the future, how Saudi Arabia is trying to reduce youth unemployment by creating a homegrown car industry from scratch. Welcome back to the program. I'm Nima Abuarte. Now, in a crisis, investors take their money out of emerging markets and put it somewhere safe. And this has meant a tough few years for the Middle East's private equity firms. The global recession, coupled with Dubai's debt crisis, has meant that investment in this region has slumped by 80%. And this part of the world still anxiously awaits the return of cash. So is the Middle East still a player in the private equity game? That's a question I put to Paul Forsyth, the head of Apache Advisors. Investments do go through phases, but at the end of the day, there will still be requirements for capital raising. At the moment, we've said that, you know, the debt markets are very, very difficult, but businesses will still be seeking capital, not necessarily for startup, for further expansion. There's a number of reasons why they will want finance. And I believe that private equity funds or investors who act like private equity funds will still be looking for these opportunities. It's the way of the world. It's not going to go away. So it has been more difficult for them to raise capital because the traditional ways of investing uh, have gone and they're finding it a little bit more difficult to raise cash under those circumstances. You advise people who want to raise money. You also advise people who want to spend that money. What are you saying to them when it comes to this part of the world? We're finding that investors, to some degree, see better alternatives in other emerging markets, like the BRICS markets, Brazil, Russia, India, China. And the Middle East markets tend to lose out a little bit. There are reasons to do with transparency, corporate governance, liquidity, and so forth, but they're quite small. And I think the, the Middle East has perhaps moved off the radar screen as a result of issues like Dubai World last year that uh, undermined a little bit of confidence in the region. But nevertheless, we still get people with niche products who still come to raise capital, and we think that they will be able to do so. What we try and do is advise them on the, not who they should go and talk to and how you can raise $50 million here or $50 million there, but the way in which they structure their offering. So if we find that someone is coming to Dubai or the UAE generally or the Gulf as a last resort, we would tend to discourage them because they will not succeed. So what's the state of play 
when it comes to private equity in the Middle East? I think it's difficult to see actual opportunities in this region. You know, the private equity market has been underpinned by real estate. And I think that's going to lie at the back of uh, many people's minds for a long while. There are, are businesses that are looking for capital, but they need to be invested in for the right reasons. If it's a distress type of situation, obviously it's a much less attractive opportunity for private, private equity funds and other investors. If it is raising capital for a growing business to take it to the next stage, there will still be scope for that. Paul Forsyth of Apache Advisors speaking to me earlier. Right, let's see what other business stories are making headlines across the region this week. Debt laden Adar, which is Abu Dhabi's biggest developer and part owned by the government, has reported its largest ever quarterly loss. The builder of many of Abu Dhabi's best known projects, including the Yas Marina Formula One circuit, recently received a $5.2 billion bailout from the government. Last month, the travel developer said it expects to return to a profit this year. Royal Dutch Shell is poised to sign a $12 billion joint venture with Baghdad to capture and sell gas from the country's southern oil fields. The gas is currently being burnt as a waste byproduct from the oil fields near Basra due to the country's lack of infrastructure for gas processing. Dubai Aerospace Enterprise, a leasing firm that rents planes to other airlines, has cancelled another order for Boeing jets. The firm has pulled out of plans to buy 32 Boeing 737s, valued at more than $2 billion. It follows a similar move last year when it cancelled an order for 50 jets from Boeing and Airbus worth around $8 billion. Now, one of the biggest underlying reasons for the unrest we've seen in Egypt and Tunisia has been a lack of jobs and opportunity for the region's young population. Very few industries can absorb the region's growing workforce and reduce youth unemployment. But Saudi Arabia believes it has the answer. It wants to grow its manufacturing sector and start from scratch a homemade automotive industry, as Philip Hampshire has been finding out in Riyadh. This exploded view of a Daihatsu Syrian hangs at King Saud University in Riyadh. Despite its Damien Hirst-style qualities, it's not dangling from the ceiling of the art department. It's in industrial engineering. Here they give students the skills they need to thrive in a workplace. That's important. According to government data, Saudi Arabia has a youth unemployment rate of 30.2%. Simply to absorb all the young people entering the workforce, it needs 310,000 jobs a year. So giving these engineers training is all very well. But what are they actually going to do? The answer is, start up an indigenous car industry. Uh, actually, the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia has got a strategic plan uh, to transfer the country from the bin, or relying on oil to rely on different resources like uh, industry. So the idea of the Gazelle uh, is to help the country to play its role in the uh, industrial world. First, the university started out setting a project to design vehicles. From the best elements, a body shell was selected. Another group had to design a robot and software capable of building the car. Once that was complete, they scaled it up to the real thing. All of it designed and put together within Saudi Arabia. This is the basis of an entirely new industry giving the specific skills necessary to the young engineers who will one day run it. But it doesn't stop there. Computer-aided design was used to put together the blueprints. What tires and glass to use became further projects. That makes it the first car specifically tailored for the Middle Eastern market. You know that Saudi Arabia is a uh, center between Asia and Africa. It's a good uh, strategic location for uh, this project. And we have high demand. Every year, the increasing demand, it's approximately 1.8, the growth. Uh, so we have the capability, we have the resources, we have everything. We need only the knowledge. And it's even been tested for how the car will perform if it hits a camel. And of course, that entirely depends on how exactly the unlucky camel is hit. A camel accident is the most uh, dangerous accident in Saudi Arabia also in uh, some Arabic country. So uh, we had uh, study the population of camels, including weight, 
body dimension, uh, number of camels. Before we uh, simulated the crash using advanced software. And this is the prototype body for the Gazelle 1. Underneath this bonnet it will have enough power to give you 200 kilometers per hour as a maximum speed. This one's been taken to the 2010 Geneva Motor Show where it caused a sensation. One of them has already been built and given to the king as a present. So how does it drive? Well, fortunately, I managed to borrow the king's very own model to take it out for a spin. It's designed to meet the exacting fashion sense of potential Middle Eastern customers. But is it simply a vanity project, one that will never come to fruition? Well, already land has been selected for the 4x4's manufacturing plant. Work will soon start on putting the production line together. They're already working on a saloon model. With 350 million people in the Arab world as a potential market, they reckon they've got a good chance for capturing a local niche. It's a remarkably smooth ride, and we didn't even hit any camels. Philip Hampshire reporting from Riyadh there. Well, our time is very nearly up. I do hope you've enjoyed our programme. Before we go, let's see how the region's main markets have performed this week. And remember, we'd love to hear from you. Our email address is middleeastbiz at bbc.co.uk. And remember, you can keep up to date with us every day of the week now using Twitter and Facebook. That's where you'll see the latest photos and news from the BBC's teams across the world. Now, next week, we're looking at calls to create a single Gulf stock market. Could a joined up exchange revive investor interest? Until then, from me, Nima Abuarte, and the rest of the team, thank you for watching. Bye bye.